Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Retire with Style podcast, post the century mark on our episodes. That's uh, right. What do you, yeah. What do you think, Wade? I'm ready. Yeah, ready to go. We're at. We're actually at episode 102 at this point because our hundredth episode became a two-parter. We're happy to get so many questions from people who attended the live session. So thank you so much for that. But we're we're, we're uh, but I noticed. Brie on the in our Spotify, she still calls the previous one episode hundred. So I think numerically this is one oh one. This but, is one oh one. Okay. Yes, yes. We're already we're we're, we're gonna have to put an asterisk on this one. So ten years from now we'll know what, what the heck happened. <laughs> <laughs> but uh wait like, yeah, yeah, like you like your push ups. This is the second episode of our uh, arc on uh on ladders, time segmentation strategy. But like I said, like your push-ups, which we'll talk about in a second, you're going to be carrying most of this episode. You're going to be doing some heavy lifting on this one. You're good with that? <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. This is a topic I've written about. So happy to, to play that role. <laughs> and how is that different from any other episode, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's retirement focused, maybe yeah. that's a different well, it's called retire with style. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so I, we do veer off. since it's been a while, it's been two weeks or so since we've actually been recording this. Since we had you know a couple in the yeah. cans. What what's the number? So I, man? <laughs> well, I listened to episode ninety nine last night as a review. I, I don't always listen to our episodes, but because I don't like to hear my voice, but I did listen to. The previous episode at at two point two times speed. That's my usual speed, and at that speed, it sounded pretty good. So I yeah, we covered we sound, everything well. We? Do we sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks? <laughs> no, no, the podcast players don't do that. I don't know. No? It's some technology how they avoid making it sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks, but it, it sounds like your regular voice just speaking faster. Oh, okay. you've never played around with that? No, I, I just apps? listened at one point oh. I don't know why. I I tried sometimes at one point two, but then. I don't know. I miss, you see, you're so measured. And so I miss the nuances of your purposeful <laughs> pauses. <laughs> and, and actually, believe it or not, I listened to it at regular speed just to, you know, in, in some valiant effort of improving. I, I try to say, okay, what can I do better or not? But I don't know how that's going. Uh, and, but I am happy to say on episode 99, you don't listen to these podcasts because you don't like to hear your voice as, a, as opposed to my voice. <laughs> <laughs> no, it. At 2.2 speed, you sound very wise and knowledgeable. So. Really? <laughs> Let's crank it up to four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So at least it'll be actually. over quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Get it over with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, so would you like, so just a, a quick recap since 99, I haven't, I listened to it when it came out, but I haven't re-listened to it and it's been a few weeks. What are, what are some of those highlights so we can sort of on-ramp into, into this episode? Yeah, well, highlights. We we're talking about time segmentation, also known as bucketing. Uh, we talked about the idea that just if you ask 100 different people what time segmentation is, you would get 100 different answers that can make it complicated to start discussing. But then we used asset dedication, which is a specific, they, and they don't consider themselves time segmentation, I think, because they don't want to be lumped in with all the other <laughs> not necessarily uh, sophisticated time segmentation methods out there. But I view them as the platonic ideal in terms of how to explain time segmentation. You have a front end bond ladder, you have a, and then you have a growth portfolio earmarked more for longer term expenses. And then to have a complete time segmentation method, you need to have some sort of mechanism for how you allocate from the long-term bucket into the short-term bucket as you spend from the short-term bucket. And that's really what we're getting to today is we didn't talk about those mechanisms. How do you decide when to allocate from the long-term bucket into the short-term bucket? Uh, we will talk about that in detail today, but, but that was the idea. The other aspect to review from the previous episode, a key idea of time segmentation is you don't really care what your asset allocation is anymore. It, it's going to be dynamic. It's going to bounce around because it's, it falls out of well, how much bonds did it take to build my short-term bucket? And then the rest goes in the long-term bucket of stocks. And whatever allocation that is in terms of what percentage stocks, what percentage is bonds, you don't really care. And that's a big part of what makes time segmentation different from a total return investing approach is you're not rebalancing to a fixed asset allocation. You're letting your asset allocation fluctuate because bonds and stocks serve different purposes. Bonds are used to meet expenses 
And so how much bonds you have depends on how much expenses you're trying to meet with reliable income. Stocks provide growth. And there's a belief in the idea of stocks for the long run. So you want to have as much as possible in stocks. And it's just everything that's not earmarked as reliable income for upcoming expenses goes into the stock bucket. Okay. Something that I, I think bears mentioning since we're, you know, Risa centric as well on, on this podcast, and we mentioned it, and, and I'll have you maybe touch upon it. But what are the main factors? Because if someone's listening in, the, the obvious question is always not if someone, the people that are listening in. <laughs> <laughs> we might have a listener this week. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm hoping. I'm hoping it's going to happen at episode 101. Wait, it's going to happen. Just believe, just believe. No, but uh, for those listening, the, the obvious kind of thing you're always thinking to yourself what am i what am i you know is, is this an option for me is this an alternative for me based on the research framework who would this uh apply to or who would this most likely resonate with and then a, a, a side note I'm, I'm always intrigued with time segmentation and the secondary factor of true liquidity you know as, as just the final kind of fyi on, on the previous episode do you mind chiming in yeah, absolutely. So time segmentation is one of the four styles. It's the style associated with, it's one of the ones we call a hybrid because it's not as common in terms of the underlying preferences. It's your safety first. So you want contractual protections and your optionality oriented. You want as much flexibility as possible. And so time segmentation evolved since the 1980s when different financial planners or advisors started thinking about how can we build strategies for clients in the real world? It kind of evolved from that idea of, well, let's use bonds for short-term upcoming expenses. Let's use, and then that's the safety first component. If I hold a bond to maturity, you can treat that as a contractual protection that I'll get the face value back at maturity as long as the bond doesn't default. So I get my safety first protections through these short-term buckets. And then I get my optionality through the, the longer-term growth-oriented buckets that provide me flexibility for when I reallocate, uh, I have the opportunity to make changes to, to, to change my, my spending goals and, and so forth. And so the flexibility and optionality comes from the long-term buckets. And then yes, indeed, time segmentation being on the left-hand side of the matrix does have a correlation from the secondary factors for true liquidity, which is there's more this sense of you're not just using a pot of assets to draw from for anything that might come your way, any sort of spending shock and so forth. You actually want to allocate different assets for different purposes. And so there's more a sense of we're earmarking assets for our budget. And only by doing that can we then view any other assets as actual reserves available for other types of spending shocks. And, and there's more concerns for individuals in this half of the matrix about having reserves set aside for spending shocks like healthcare, long-term care, and so forth. Yeah. No, no. I just wanted to, I, I think that's relevant, like, you know, who this applied to, you know, from, from that perspective. Because I think when, you, when you're going to get into these strategies, to me, there's echoes of, of uh, this foundational organizing principle of, not guardrails, that's the wrong word, but there, I don't know, there's there's total return aspects to it in terms of these distribution rules. And, you know, there's rules with regards to uh, bond laddering that are a little different, you know, to accommodate for that quadrant. But I, I think at heart, there, there, there are some similarities there, there too. And so, uh, you know, I just wanted to point out who does this kind of resonate with if you're thinking about, you know, a bucketing strategy for yourself, et cetera. And this is beyond just, to me, bond laddering. This could be using MIGAs or this could be, just holding cash for significant periods of time. I, I just view those as real <laughs> short, you know, maturity instruments, you know, six month CDs, right. you know, I, I think falls in that, in that realm pretty easily, but it, it, I think that's a good preamble. Wade, what do you think? Yeah. And uh, with that idea right now with our inverted yield curve, where interest rates are pretty high on short-term <laughs> bond holdings, like, like cash reserves or short-term treasury bills, you, you certainly can view that as an option that rather than having a specific bond maturing each year for the next eight years, you do kind of draw more from a, a short term type holding that you are real. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, rolling and, over over time. And I think this happens even with people that have advisory relationships. I can say with our clients or at McLean, and we'll have Rob Cordo in, in our next episode chime in. But there's some clients that they're in a total return strategy with us, but we know full well 
that that's almost an intermediary because they they're carrying in effect let's say three years of cash or two years of cash you know outside you know so by mm -hmm. default it's kind of a, a segmentation play as well right and that's an important distinction that well what is time segmentation and what is just having a big pile of cash on the sidelines i i try to treat those as separate things if you time segmentation is more your your cash bucket is part of your portfolio. You view it as part of your asset allocation. It's part of your distribution strategy versus if you just have your total returns investing portfolio, but you happen to have a big pile of cash sitting on the sidelines that you really don't view as part of that portfolio, then I would frame that more as a buffer asset being used more as a, like you might tap into that if the markets are doing poorly, but otherwise it's just sort of a cash reserve sitting on the sidelines. Yeah, I wouldn't right. classify that as time segmentation, but it probably it's somewhere in the middle between like someone who's on the recent matrix close to the dividing line between time segmentation and total no, returns. I, I, I might like that I cash reserve. I agree. I, and I would say I just view all of that. You see it as, as a buffer. And yes, but it's also as much as you can pretend it's not part of your allocation. You know, the, really, the reality is, if you were to line up your assets, it is part of your allocation. It's just oh, it definitely cash. is. Yeah, it's just it's just the cash. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, just you chose to hold cash as opposed to international emerging market small caps. You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, I think in that context, if you ask someone, "What's your asset allocation?" If they forget to include the cash, then that's kind of the idea I'm suggesting. Mm -hmm. Of okay, mm -hmm. then it's. They're not really thinking of it as part of their portfolio, but, but it certainly is. Yes, absolutely. At the household balance sheet level. <laughs> the end of the day is what you have, right? So, but that's, you know, that that's good enough. So uh, what are the ways to, okay, let's say this is a segmentation strategy is something you want to apply. How do you go about determining uh, when to, when to ladder it, you know, or when to <laughs> replenish, when to refill or whatever word we want to use? Yeah, so we'll talk about three general methods to do that. And then the first method we'll talk about is probably the most straightforward and kind of intuitive one, but it, it actually ends up working the worst <laughs> in most contexts. But it, first, let's just talk about an automatic method where, and let's put some context around this. Let's say we have a 10-year bond letter. Okay, so we set up 10-year bond letter. It could be 10 years before retirement. We start buying a 10-year bond each year so that when we get to retirement, we have bonds maturing for the next 10 years. Or if we retired and we're suddenly, oh, I want to be time segmentation, we build out a 10-year ladder at that point. Now, one year later, we spend that first rung of the ladder. We spend the, the first year bucket. And at that point, we'd have nine years left on our bond ladder. So an automatic method would be where every year we're going to replenish and buy a new 10-year bond so that we always maintain that 10-year bond ladder. So we're automatically each year selling from the growth bucket to purchase a new bond to be the new last rung of the ladder. And we're gonna, it's like we're climbing up a ladder, we're building out rung by rung automatically each year. Okay, so with that, now what happens is this can actually increase your sequence risk and can cause your growth portfolio to deplete first. <laughs> because if you're automatically always replenishing that ladder, you're not really paying any attention to like, is your growth portfolio doing well or not? If there's a market downturn and if interest rates are, you get into this issue of, well, on the one hand, I get to discount for 10 years. If I'm going to, I'm going to take a distribution and cover my spending 10 years from now. I don't have to take out the full amount I want to spend because with interest, it's going to grow to match that. So when interest rates are low, there's not a whole lot of difference. I may be taking close to the full 10 year spending out. When interest rates are more normalized, you actually do have a discount on that. But you have to consider I'm taking that from a smaller chunk of the portfolio. Like if I ended up being 40% bonds to build my 10 year ladder, 60% stocks, I'm now taking the present value of a full year of distribution from that 60% portion of my assets. That could be a higher withdrawal rate kind of just have to work out whether or not, like if I'm trying to use a 4% rule, well, <laughs> I may be using more than 4% to take out that distribution from a smaller chunk of my portfolio. So that can make it more vulnerable to, to the sequence of returns risk. And then what happens when you simulate an automatic ladder over time, 
eventually the, the growth portfolio depletes first. And when that happens, when you deplete your growth portfolio, you're now 100% bonds, you have a 10 year bond ladder in place, then you spend it down and 10 years later, you run out of money. So when markets don't do well, because you're always automatically replenishing, it's the opposite of the rising equity glide path. It's actually going to push you towards 100% bonds and, and lock in failure for your retirement plan. It's funny you, you, were, you said it's the opposite of the rising equity glide path, because when you were saying that, I was thinking, <laughs> you know, this is where people get, you know, you, and, you know, when you get to the middle of the RISA matrix between probability and safety first, right? Uh, rising equity glide path, effectively what you would do is you just, let's say you set up your bridge, your five-year ladder or one-time ladder, and you just don't replenish it. Oh, well, that's <laughs> another, yeah, <laughs> I guess you could have started there. You kind of, no, but you kind of, that, that kind of is that equity rising life path. It's just, <laughs> it's almost like an initial bond ladder that doesn't get re-laddered or, or whatever, you know? So uh, I, that was going through my head when you were, when you were saying that, but yeah. Yeah. That, I, so that one's not replenishing. That's, and then, so I did research in this area with Michael Kitsis, and then he wrote a blog post about that, calling it the bond tent idea where, yeah, if you just had a 10 year ladder at the start of retirement, you spent it down. And then whatever your growth portfolio was, you maintain the asset allocation there. That's that's a practical way to implement the rising equity glide path. But oh, that's because then, you're never replenishing the bond ladder. But then at the end of that, the only question, because somebody could be thinking about this. So think about if you can talk about the calisthenics about this. At the end of that, you don't want to end up with 100% equity portfolio either. So when you start this, is your bond ladder the only exposure to a fixed income that you have? Or do you just slowly rebalance it to increase a bond exposure? So by, at the end of, let's say if it was a seven-year ladder, at the end of the seven years, you've kind of eased your way into some sort of balanced portfolio. Are you talking about the bond tent approach? Or yes, the automatic? yeah, yeah. For people thinking about how <laughs> yeah, that. Right. Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. Sorry. So you yeah. probably, if you're doing the bond tent, right, you probably wouldn't be 100% stocks in that growth portfolio. You'd choose what you'd like to get to as your, uh, whatever your strategic asset allocation is that you should be using with the bond tent idea, you start off with more bonds, but you spend that down in that laddered approach. And then once that's gone, you're now at your strategic asset allocation. Yeah. And you're saying conceptually though, you're saying the robotic approach, which is just every year, just rinse, repeat, buy a new issue, et cetera, et cetera effectively doesn't work as well as the ease of the implementation because of sequence risk. If, if you do this the first number of years and there's a negative return to your point to replenish the bonds, you know, it, you know, regardless of market down, regardless of, of need for the actual cash since you have, you know, you already earmarked your needs for the few years, but if you're constantly replenishing it, you could be to replenish it. You could be, distributing from that portfolio more than 4% just to buy the bond instrument. Hence, a couple of negative market return with like a 5, 6, 7% distribution, you're running into trouble. That's that's the yeah. downside that you've seen. Yeah, at the basic level, you're taking a full year's distribution from a smaller chunk of your portfolio because you're taking it only from the growth part of the portfolio. Now, you don't have to take out the full year distribution because... Uh, you, you can take the present value. <laughs> it, whatever you take out, you're going to put in a bond that's going to include interest. And that's what, when interest rates are low enough, though, you're probably still using a higher withdrawal rate from your growth portfolio to automatically replenish your bond ladder. And that can be problematic. That's when I simulate these different approaches, the automatic approach does perform the worst. Yeah. And when you say the present value is you don't need to buy a $10,000 bond if you need $10,000 in 10 years. You can just buy, I don't know, a four thousand dollar bond. All right, that seems like well, a lot. That imply a pretty I mean, high interest mean, rate, but <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I'm just <laughs> you know the number, whatever. Something lower than that, knowing that in ten years it'll hit that number. Right. Exactly. All right. That's the first one. What's numero mm -hmm. dos? Numero dos, I, I call. <laughs> Wait. There we go. There we go. <laughs> it's the market-based oh approach. Yeah, the market-based approach, you could, it's using some sort of external like trigger to decide when to extend the ladder. This could be anything really, but we see a lot within, 
it, what I'm maybe to back up another second, what I'm talking about right now with extending the ladder, these same methods I'm talking about get used all over the place in retirement income planning. Right now we're talking about when do you extend your bond ladder? But if you're using a variable spending strategy, the same method could be used to decide when should I cut my spending or when should I not cut my spending? So uh, that was if you're using my a, point about the echoes of like these spending strategies. Yeah, yeah, it's the same um, underlying kind of mechanisms that get used. Also with buffer assets, like when, mm -hmm. with the idea of I have a reverse mortgage standby line of credit, when should I spend from the reverse mortgage? When should I spend from my investment portfolio? or the same sort of approach with life insurance. It's the same thing. You, these methods I'm talking about right now get used in that context as well. And so when I say a, a market-based approach to when you extend the bond ladder, I'll talk about the one that gets discussed a lot in the context of not just this, but with like when I spend from a reverse mortgage and so forth. And it's, did, the, did your portfolio increase in the previous year? So if your portfolio had a positive return in the previous year, go ahead and extend your ladder this year. If your portfolio had a negative return in the previous year, do not extend the ladder this year. And uh, you, I mean, there's some flexibility about how you do this, but the way I model it is you're going to wait for a positive return again. So if you have two years of negative returns in a row, you don't extend the ladder for two years. Your, your 10 year ladder is now down to eight years. If you get another negative return, you don't extend again, your ladder's down to seven years. Finally, there's a positive return in the market. You're gonna go ahead and build that ladder back out to 10 years. So that's the way I, I modeled the idea. And, and you see that used in other contexts as well. Like I was saying, like, should I take an inflation adjustment for my spending? Well, I'll take it if the market was up or if my portfolio gained in the previous year, but if my portfolio was down in the previous year, I don't take the inflation adjustment. Or if the portfolio was down in the previous year, I'll cover my spending through a reverse mortgage this year. Same conversation. And uh, that's the idea. I, <laughs> it's market-based. There's some market-based external trigger that determines when you extend your ladder. Yeah. And look, you could, we could go over and over, you know, various approaches like this. I, I, in a similar manner that I have somewhat of a disdain, if you will, for all these special rules with levers on sustainable distribution rates from a total return portfolio, I, I kind of see similarities here in the sense of folks kind of back in, you know, someone's a, a, a consumer who's well read, you know, is up is up on the literature on distribution rates and that somehow doesn't sit well with them, let's say. And uh, it doesn't resonate with them. And they're like, you know, time segmentation is the way to go because, you know, I want to have that kind of intermediary. You know, and they do that through through these cash flows that bonds or MIGA or whatever kick off. But then the issue of replenishing comes up and they apply similar type of levers, if you will. And I and I think they, they these folks tend to get a fall. And, and please bring it up if I'm throwing a straw man argument up. I, I don't mean to. But I, I get the sense that they they just back into things historically and say, OK, well, now this would have worked all the time. This would have worked 80% of the time. This would work 70% of the time. And, and, and this is why you have so many strategies, right? And I don't, I just don't think scientifically that's the way to go about thinking about this, you know? Sure. You can back into something that may have worked historically, but there's no real reason why something would work right. over the other. Even if you've seen it, it, it just happened to fall that way. And you know what, that doesn't really mean it's going to happen in the future. And so I, I think a lot of people have these false sense of security about this, or they, there's some magical method that they figured out for replenishing it. They write a blog post, it, you know, whatever with bucket graphics and, and off they go, right. Showing how they've protected themselves. I, I, I think that's, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any magic to it. And I don't think there's any panacea effects to it. There's, there's no increase in efficacy just because they've done it in a certain way. I, I just think it's more, the framing works better for them from a discipline standpoint. That, that's all I, I, I think you have there. And that's valuable. I don't mean to discount the value in framing it properly to maintain discipline, but I don't think from an optimization standpoint, there's something magical going on here. And uh, I, I, I think that's a misconception that some folks have, that there is some way to segment according to a special rules-based market approach 
that is infallible. Right, right. And so with that sort of method I was describing it, uh, in the reverse mortgage context, I called it the naive approach. And I realized afterwards that's maybe not the, the it was in front of the creator of that method in the reverse mortgage world. Way to make friends, <laughs> Wade. Way to make friends. <laughs> yes, right, right. There is a naivety to it, though, because it's it doesn't keep track of where you're at, right? So the market was down 20% one year. The next year, the market's down 15%. Then the third year, the market's up 5%. You're going to go ahead and fully replenish the ladder at that point, even though you're still like net down, whatever, like 30% or whatever with the numbers I was saying. Uh, it's, it's just that you're not really looking at the full financial situation with that when you're using these types of market-based triggers. You're not really looking at the cumulative impact of what's been going on. And that's where you can probably do better than this. Uh, it's just, this does work better than the automatic approach because it's not always forcing you, especially when you're hit by the, the sequence of returns risk here. When you have the downturn, you don't replenish the ladder. You're giving your portfolio a better shot at some recovery. So it does work better than the automatic approach, but it's not going to be ultimately the, the approach I would suggest to use. And, and as you were saying, right, you can backtest all this stuff and figure out, oh, okay, this particular method worked best. Uh, in the past, but, but if there's no real theoretical reason behind it, you're really just torturing the data at that point, and uh, you don't really have a clear explanation for why the particular explicit rule you decided on would be the one that works best in the future. So yeah, you, you can over-engineer this type of thing easily when you start <laughs> digging into the weeds too much with it. I, I, I think so. I, I really think so. And, and these people are well-intentioned, but I, I see it all the time, especially retirees that are more of the engineering bent, if, if you will, but you know, to each his own. Uh, what, what do you feel is a better state of the art with regards to this? And can you introduce the number in Spanish? <laughs> Numero trace. <laughs> there we go. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. And so trace this, it's the same conversation. We see this in the reverse mortgage world. We see it in different places. I really first learned about this method from asset dedication. They call it the critical path. I call it like, I think, and I'm forgetting if they use the term person, I call it a personalized glide path. I forget exactly the term they use, but it's based on the critical path. The idea here is you work through some calculations in a spreadsheet. Uh, given the assets you have today and given what you want to do, like, do you want your portfolio to hit zero at age 105? Or do you want your portfolio to still have $200,000 left at age 100? You, you decide what do you want? Where do you want to be at in the future? Where are you at today? And then with an acceptable a rate of return that you find acceptable, you calculate or you really may have to solve for the rate of return to do this, but you calculate a path. This is how much wealth I need to have each year for my re entire retirement to be on track with the plan. Now, you're never going to precisely follow that critical path. Your remaining wealth is either going to be above that path or below that path. But that path becomes the, the triggering mechanism. And, and you can see this is more linked to your plan because it's not, like I was saying, the naive approach with market-based if the market kept going down and then had a small positive return, suddenly you think everything's better. <laughs> that would not be the case with a critical path. You may be well below your critical path and then you have a good market return. You may still be well below your critical path. So you're, you're still not going to take action at that point. And but you're, the idea is if your remaining wealth is above the critical path, you'll replenish the ladder. If your remaining wealth is below, you don't replenish the ladder. I would say this too, Wade, to add to that. Uh, this this gives it a contextual relevance that the other two didn't have. And so even though maybe an economic reason or whatever, it, there's an economic reason here and it's your personal economics at play. You know, that's the relevance that you're giving it now. And you're doing it from the standpoint of, a, a you know, a, a planning best practices, if you will. Now, if you're worried about, if, if someone asked, wait, but what if I'm never above my critical path? Right. So this is where this strategy does test best because now, now in the research that, that I'm doing, I, <laughs> yeah, so I do use a hundred percent stocks for my growth portfolio. When I do simulations about this in real life, your growth portfolio doesn't have to be a hundred percent stocks, 
But what happens? Yes, when you fall below your critical path, it's the opposite of the automatic approach. You stop replenishing your ladder, and at the extreme, your ladder goes down to zero. Uh, you're, you're below the critical path. You're now like 100% stocks because whatever is left in your growth portfolio, you stopped replenishing your ladder since you fell below the critical path. Now, another real world constraint, maybe you decide you're never going to let your ladder drop below three years in length. Then you'd now you'd have, an, at that point, an automatic rolling three-year ladder. But in the research version of this that I do, I let the, the ladder length drop to zero. I'm 100% stocks in the growth portfolio. So when you fall below the critical path and don't ever recover, you eventually get to 100% stocks. And you have a rising equity glide path. And no. that's what helps this strategy to work better. <laughs> now, I'm thinking someone saying, well, what's a little bit better? How much does this improve the other ones by... By you know, by ten percent, I know you can't answer it in that manner, but by an order of magnitude, or is it just a little bit better? Well, I when I looked at this, I tracked the probability of success for the financial plan for up to forty years, and this can dramatically improve the probability of success for the financial plan. But it, it's really just a function of, and this is kind of well versed terrain or whatever the term is. Uh, we know from looking at Monte Carlo simulations and historical data that for the most part, even with sequence of returns risk, higher stock allocations work better than lower stock allocations. You get a higher probability of success with higher stock allocations. And so this is really just riding on the back of, because it pushes you towards 100% stocks when your portfolio is in trouble, it's giving you the best probability that the plan will actually work out for you. And if, if in a in a manner that's noticeable in the the simulations, I no no, I, I think it's significant. I I think if if this was a strategy that I resonated with, this is the manner I would do it, simply because it's dropping in the contextual relevance of your personal situation to make a more informed decision on when to replenish the bonds or or not, or when to replenish the buckets or not. Simply because it also separates you from the temptation of of timing the market. You know, it, it's really based on something that's significantly more relevant and within your control. Now, you could be hearing all of this. And a point that I think comes up is this is why the laddering strategy at heart, a time segmentation at heart is a bit of a is a bit of a hybrid strategy. Because, yes, there is the safety of the actual short term money that's in you know, very reliable instruments. And when we're talking about bonds implicitly, we, we're always thinking in our heads either triple A, but most likely government secured bonds, like the risk-free rate. We're not talking about like the, the Enron coupons right before it went under or anything like that. That's just not, you know, for that, just put it in stocks. So, you know, from that manner, we're, we're thinking in that terms, but even then, you know, because you want that optionality, you can only get, to, get those instruments short term. So you do have to dip into the equity markets to replenish it. So there is that piece of it where you're trying to satisfy a couple of opposing sort of anchors here. So that being said, even if listening to us, you're like, yeah, well, that's not, I, I want another laddering strategy. I'm time segmentation and I want another laddering strategy that is even better, you know, that kind of thing. If that's the case, then there's really nothing for you. You really have to question, am I really a time segmentation person? You know, if this is not resonating with you, maybe you are income protection, you know, and that's where the RISA can come in and, and you can take the RISA. And, and something I didn't say that Bob would be clutching his chest if I, if I don't say it, but uh, we do have a critical path Excel available for consumers on the retirement researcher membership. Is that correct, Wade? That, that's right. Yeah, I wanted to mention that. So within uh -huh. the Retirement Researcher Academy, you can do this in an Excel spreadsheet. And we've created a tool that's an Excel spreadsheet that lets you calculate a critical path. Uh, now, most of these critical paths don't include taxes. And just at some level, you get relief because if your portfolio is doing poorly, it may also reduce your tax bills. And then you have now a variable spending strategy, but where it's lower taxes is helping to to lower distributions. But yeah, you can use that critical path tool. But the other thing I wanted to say, and, and this was not an effort to over-engineer, uh, but I did test 16 different styles mm -hmm. of decision rules, not, not to like data mine it too much. But what I found from doing that was because a, an issue, like you can use our Excel spreadsheet to create a critical path, but like practically speaking, a lot of people will struggle with how in the world do I create this critical path? 
I found an alternative version of the critical path that's actually easy to implement. And as best as I can tell, seems to work just as well as a more complicated critical path. And that was simply, you record, what's the value of your investment portfolio at retirement? And you don't even have to worry about increasing it for inflation. You just have to remember that number. And then in years when your portfolio has grown above that level in nominal terms, spend from the portfolio, or I'm sorry, in this context, it's <laughs> extend your ladder, replenish your ladder. When your remaining wealth has dropped below that threshold, do not replenish the ladder. And it's the same, getting at the same idea, because if you plot out the real value of that number over time, it would be declining with age, which is what a critical path is going to be doing as well. So it's, Maybe not truly the the optimal way, but it, like we were talking about earlier, there, you really can't define a truly optimal way. All I can say is this simple approach of remembering this one number and using it as a threshold uh, seemed to work as well as any more complicated critical path method. Yeah, and, and again, you could be listening to this and you could be thinking, okay, but I'm, you know, and, and this is the case that I'm about to say, you know, Mazel tov or whatever, but uh let's say you retire and you have five million dollars wade but i'm 90 now and i don't care what i had when i was retired five million dollars i'm very comfortable below you know whatever because i can't take it with me you know what would what would be your uh -huh. comment there well so that's where it's not five million inflation adjusted so in in nominal terms by the time you're 90 that five million number might only be worth two million what so it is retired at 89 years old. <laughs> well, then, then, okay. <laughs> then it's a different situation. <laughs> then you can probably use a higher withdrawal rate if you're trying to spend your $5 million. <laughs> nah, I'm messing with you. No, no, that's a good point. Yeah, there's, you know, the, 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 the what's it called? The, 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 the actual, purchasing power yeah, the is purchasing declining. Yeah, the purchasing power is different. Nah, that's true. All right. Uh, anything else for today? Uh, well, yeah, to just kind of then summarize why the this glide path approach works best i said it before it's because when you're falling behind when you're losing hope when you're running out of money <laughs> it pushes you towards 100 percent stocks and that helps it to provide a better outcome and like for the the asset dedication team they're very bullish on the idea of stocks for the long run so they're they're happy about this they're happy about you know you want stocks because stocks will should help you grow and achieve more wealth over time. And so it, it, what time segmentation does, we're pushing away from a static asset allocation. And we don't care what our stock bond mix is. It's just we want bonds for the latter. We want stocks for everything else. And so you're going to have a dynamic asset allocation. And when markets are not doing as well, when you're falling behind your glide path, it's going to be a, a dynamic asset allocation that pushes you more aggressive. And so if you then looked at your asset allocation and said, wait a second, markets are, markets are doing poorly. Mostly I should be panicked and selling my stocks. No, this is, I'm going to stay the course and hold on to my stocks and not, not deviate from that plan. I'm going to get more aggressive with my asset allocation, even though everyone else looks like they're panicking. But then that's the behavioral side of it. Like that's what they're telling you you want to do. <laughs> when markets are going down, you want to hold on to your stocks because a subsequent Hopefully they'll they'll recover at that point. And this is how you build more opportunity to let your stocks recover because you don't sell from them to fund expenses. You just spend down your ladder with the idea that the market will recover before you've spent down your ladder entirely. And then once you get that recovery, now it's quite possible for you to drop below your critical path and then go back above it again later. And then you go ahead and start replenishing at that point. And that does simulate a better outcome than just say a static 60-40 portfolio in retirement or any of these other automatic or market-based approaches. So if you're comfortable behaviorally with that idea and kind of the motivation of using time segmentation is this is the story to help you make comfortable, be comfortable with that idea, then you can argue that, that time segmentation is a better way to invest. But at the end of the day, it's because it's pushing you to be more aggressive when markets aren't doing well. And that's what allows it to work better in these sorts of simulations. So if you're comfortable with that, by all means, you've got yourself a viable retirement income strategy. I agree. No, I, I, I agree. And for those that it resonates with, this is, 
this is this would pro this would most likely be my my method of choice. So, you know, we talked about the theory behind all of this and some sort of implementation components. I, I alluded to it earlier. In the next episode, we'll have Rob Cordeaux, an advisor in McLean, just talk about client stories and how this is this is done. Because I, I think this is one of those that I, if you're listening in, you could be like, oh, I want to do this when I retire. But then, okay, how do I start? How do I actually start and, <laughs> and arrange the, you know, start playing musical chairs with, with my balance sheet, if you will. So we'll move away from the abstraction of my Monte Carlo simulations and into a real world implementation. Yes, but I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't uh, be so hard on yourself, Wade. It wasn't <laughs> I think, I think, I, I, I don't know. I was able to paint, paint a clear picture in my head of what you were speaking about. So, okay. you know, I, I wouldn't be too hard on yourself. But you didn't say at the beginning. I, I forgot. Just to wrap it up now. Push-ups. Where are we by? <laughs> I did do the hundred on the day of the hundredth episode. I've not gotten up to a hundred since then, but I'm still at least getting twenty right. to fifty a day. And yeah, I need That's to. Good focus on 100 every day that's eventually i'll get there <laughs> <laughs> just messing man all right all right everyone thank you thank you for listening in and we'll catch you uh next week all right thanks everyone